One SA movement leader, Musi Maimani, a very good morning to you and thanks for making the time. Uh, we know you're not only a political leader, you're also a religious leader. So happy Easter. What are you doing today? Yeah, let me let me join um, many South Africans and wish, especially those who celebrate Easter, a very special Easter. I'll be with my family today and um, it's been a very peaceful and a great weekend to just reflect on just the grace and the forgiveness and um, and just uh, as a deep piece of intro introspection for us as a family. So so thank you and I wish everybody a special one. Really? A great weekend? Um, we saw your initial reaction <laughs> where you said to be called an experiment was the most dehumanizing thing that's happened to you. Yeah. With the benefit of time and I imagine multiple other conversations, how are you now uh, taking in Tony Leon's sessions? You know, at some level, of course, the project of, de of dehumanizing is certainly one that is historic, you know. I was offended and found the comments offensive, but in some ways not surprised because, like I say, there's, this is not something that is unique in this instance. It's something that happens to many South Africans. Whether you are in the corporate space, someone says to you, okay, you have a leadership role, and then... Then they suddenly, suddenly there are some people who say, well, we are in charge, we can take it away, give it away whenever we feel like it. Whereas in a political party, it's an election. I stood for an election and won. And so at some level, you've got to sit back and say, it says more about those who make those comments than those who are, in fact, the comments are made about. And I think being the weekend of Easter, sometimes you've got to say, forgive them for they know what they are doing. Because in some ways you can realize that the project that I was engaged with is still one that is desperately needed in South Africa, a project of equality amongst races. So in some ways, a weekend like this gives you time to reflect, but to strengthen your resolve, to know that the journey to a non-racial South Africa, a South Africa that works for all races, is going to be long and hard because you are going to have people who keep referring to others as experiments. You are going to have these incidents take place and you need to strengthen your resolve if you are going to one day build a country where my kids who happen to be of mixed race that they will be able to stand up in a country and be identified by their character really as martin luther king stated you uh, interesting you say they know what they're doing you tweeted that meaning you're showing your true colors, your true self. Uh, what interest does Tony Leon have in uh, uh, tracking back your leadership history? Or is it just a, an interest in book sales? Well, I, whatever it is, uh, firstly, I think that well within is a fight back campaign. You'll remember when Tony Leon was leader of the DA, they ran a fight back campaign. The very campaign, he says, I did not vote for. And it was precisely for this reason, because that campaign was built on the consolidation of minorities. And so when I went into the DA, I said, you cannot just, you cannot consolidate minorities. You need to reach, reach out to black South Africans and build a party that works for all. And it seems that what is happening now, the primary interest is that it's fight back 2.0, to call it that. Because now what's happened is that as the new leadership have come back, almost the resolve and the giving up of saying we're going to pursue a South Africa for all is long gone. The belief that others are just uh, uh, an experimented on is now prevalent. And more than anything, you can see that even in the outlook that the organization has taken is certainly one that is not pursuing all South Africans. It is consolidating. And ultimately, I think that that's where Tony Leon is playing a crucial role. When you were the leader of the Democratic Alliance, the, the biggest retort from uh, sections of the black society was that you're aligning with people who do not have the interest of uh, black people at heart. What was the, the brief within the party? Of course, there's the uh, external briefs where you go out and give your mandates, but just internally, give us a sense of what you had to go through in terms of fighting for your place within this traditionally white party. Well, I can use one typical example. You know, when I thought that the constitution of the DA must have the clause of diversity within it, 
that clause that said that the DA should never ever be a party for one race, but really be diverse in all its sections. It'd be diverse in terms of race, gender, all of those. The war that ensued inside the party, the fact that there were so many who were writing openly, publicly saying they reject this, that when you had to even diversify lists of parliament or legislatures and fight that there be, it can't just be a list of just white males. It ought to be a list that is diverse. That in fact, that when we're talking about reconciliation in this country, we must recognize that not all people are wanting reconciliation. That even for those in the party that I didn't share common history with, that had come under Tony Leon from the National Party in that merger, where to work hard to say to them, look, Let's work together towards this project that the offense against black people must not be a black versus white fight, but that there must be people who say black and white, we reject exclusion, we need redress in this country. Those wars kept ensuing and kept fighting and fighting. And part of it is that now those things are seen as a lack of direction, that the new direction is suddenly the direction. So you realize that you eventually once you've been fighting for those issues and continuously, that you have to go charter this path outside. And that's why we had to start One South Africa. But it has been, I, I, I do not regret my time at the DA. I think it was an important fight and a fight that must always be fought in this nation. But you realize that ultimately there are some who that project does not appeal to and will do whatever it takes to preserve a particular lager, a particular privilege. So I want to ask you this. If Tony Leon's uh, aim was to offend, were you offended? But I also want to ask you, the, uh, the interview was in relation to an upcoming book of his. And if he mentions this in the interview, possibility is that this is mentioned in the book. Do you know if this, uh, segment, there's a segment about this in his book? And if it is, uh, is there anything you're going to do about this? Uh, are you taking any legal recourse? No, you know, look, um, like I said, it, in the context of the book, if, he's, if there's an interest of selling the book and he wants to describe me in that sense, it says more about him than it says about me. And having looked at the book, the basic argument has to do with the fact that, A, I did not vote, I did not vote for the fight back campaign, and I maintain that. And I was right not to do so. The question that's on the table, and this is the bit that he needs to explain to the rest of the people inside the DA, is who are the experimenters and who's been experimented on? That's the question. And I think for me, I don't need to wage this war. The bigger war in this country is about the fact that, hey, we don't have, a, we don't have solutions that are focused on our unemployment. We don't have solutions that are dealing with the crime in this country and the failing education system. That's why I'm working so hard to introduce direct elections so that no one can ever say that they are accountable to some other faction, but that they are working for their communities and that there is, in fact, accountability of political principles. So these are issues that we've got to focus on. And that's why in my resolution, when you say to me what kind of weekend this has been, it's also been a weekend where you say we've got to fight harder. We've got to build harder in South Africa, a movement that will work for all our people to resolve the challenges, the greater challenges. Here we are, we have a health crisis in the middle of really the, high, the heat of, of a pandemic, we have no vaccines. So this is the war we must be focused on and being engaged in people who want to look back and focus us on the history in their own subjective terms. That will be a subject for a book I will release later, but this must be the focus for now that we have to deal with the country that, we're, that, we, are, that we are working on. What does this say about where South Africa is in terms of the race conversation? I think it says that our political parties have failed the race conversation. It says that today many speak about black parties, others speak about white parties. And so long as we have that infrastructure in place, those parties will seek to consolidate and will seek to polarize. And that is where it's most dangerous, because we cannot all be going to the polls to vote for a race and say, no, I'm voting for a black party or a white party. Then in that instance, we must take the census results and say, those are the election results. Reconciliation must be led. Economic inclusion must be led. And all of those things are leaderless at the moment. And that's why we will continually have situations where in the corporate sector, you find a black executive will tell you straight up, 
that I might be here well qualified, strong, intellectual, but never good enough, which happens so often. It's a fact that even in the sports field, you can appoint, a, as the cricket have done now, you've got a captain who happens to be a black South African. Believe you me, if he was to lose a game or, or, or win one, when he wins, he's a hero. When he loses, he'll be seen in that sense as an experiment, a failure. These are issues that we've got to confront and must be led because if we don't do that, we will always be having, I've been dealing with doctors who have been saying to me, we are all qualified. But even after our qualification, there are people who say our treatment of patients is inferior to that of a different race. We must deal with dignity, deal with a future that says we build inclusion. And ultimately, if we're going to lead, we must lead this project. And that's why I will never give up. I will never give up regardless of the comments made, whether by Mr. Leon or the current party infrastructure. I will never give up on that project. It's far too important to be left up to the political parties we have at the moment. Have you spoken to him? No, I have no need to. Um, that's why I said I think he needs to have that conversation with the current DA leadership to see whether they endorse his views on that matter. And that's why I think people like Bongani Baloi and Mike Moriarty have stood up publicly. Uh, they deserve answers. Let's speak about 1SA. Uh, last week, a ministerial committee uh, charged with advising government on amending the Electoral Act, uh, chaired by former Cabinet Minister Vali Musa, held its first consultative meeting. Of course, this is in relation to that uh, very historic uh, constitutional court judgment that ruled that the Electoral Act is unconstitutional because it does not allow independent candidates to contest. And of course, we know you've got ambitions to contest independently in 2024. What are your thoughts on this process? It's a very important process. We have to continue to um, put put the stakes on the ground. And these are as follows. I advise the committee to say, you know, you need to have an open list system because the closed list system is what creates a front in a party and, and sometimes criminals in the background. So it must be open. It must be constituency based because democracy must be brought down to the lowest level. We've wanted to introduce digital voting because in a time such as COVID, you can't be even intimating the idea that you want to postpone elections because of COVID. We can do it digitally. We've said to ourselves that that it must result in single transferable votes so that the independents don't lose the proportionality aspect of the issue. And I really believe that if we can anchor those in the new electoral system, we can ensure that democracy will never be captured and that states can never be captured by a party that says we are a majority, therefore we can deploy and use the state for our own private resources. So it's a very, very crucial uh, 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 part in, in our country and President Mandela affirmed it, President Motante affirmed it, the high-level panel report. There are many others who have made submissions to this regard in the Fancel Slabet. So, so to me, this is the central issue in South Africa. You cannot defend democracy, fight state capture, unless you are willing to reform the Electoral Act. Otherwise, another party will come into the state and do exactly what the ANC has done. Let me apologize. I think I said action is say instead of one SA. They do get a bit confusing. <laughs> but uh, in time, we'll talk to you about the work you hope to put in in your efforts to become the next president of the country. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. Musi Maimani there of 1SA. Thank you so much for talking to us.